Hello, and welcome to this episode of Gardening in the City. My name is Kane Adams, and I'm with the City of Murfreesboro's Urban Environmental Department. Today our guest is Mr. Jason Benefield of Dickens Turf and Landscape Supply Company. Uh, we're going to talk a bit, little bit about turf grass. Uh, it's one of the questions I get all the time is what can I do to make my yard look a little bit better? So we thought we'd bring in one of our local experts to assist us along in, this, in, in the project. Today we are at Oakland's Mansion. So uh, Jason, can you give us a little background on some turf grass? Yeah, I can. Uh, you know, the thing about growing grass in, in our area, you know, Mur Murfreesboro is a great place to live, but it's a tough place to grow grass. And we got two strikes going against us right off the bat. Number one is we're in the transition zone. Basically what that means, we're a little bit too far north for the warm season grasses to really thrive. They'll do well through the warmer months, but winters like last winter, you could have winter kill, things like that. They're going to go dormant in the winter and you're going to have a brown lawn. Uh, your other choice is going to be a cool season turf, but we're a little bit too far south for that. They're going to do really well during the spring and fall, but they're going to struggle through those summer months. So there's really nothing ideally suited for where we're at. Uh, then on top of that, you throw in our poor soils. I mean, our soils are really clay, a lot of rock, and the soil is what feeds the plant. So that's your second strike. So and we're in a very challenging area to try a, to grow a good consistent base of turf, it, aren't we? It, it's tough, it's tough. You have to do a lot of things to try to, you know, keeping the plant as healthy as you can is gonna be key. Uh, and then, you, you know, you always, you have weather here. You, it's so unpredictable. We may be 100 degrees for weeks at a time and no rain. Could be really wet and warm. You know, too much water is just as bad as not enough. So you got two strikes going in, you throw in a third strike of the weather and you're gonna, you're gonna have issues. So that's, that's kind of what we, how we approach when we try to help people is, you know, knowing that up front, what can we do to try to offset that or keep the plant as healthy as we can. Okay. Um, well, you mentioned warm season grasses and cool season grasses. Can you tell us uh, what types of warm season grasses grow well around here? Yeah, I mean, when you look at warm season for our area, basically the two you're gonna be looking at are gonna be Bermuda grass or zoysia grass. Uh, both are gonna do well from, you know, mid to late spring all the way through the summer going into the fall they're going to really slow down and to the point they go dormant. Uh, they you know they, they can tolerate a little lower mowing height, uh, a little wider range you know if you want them really low or up to like a lawn type height you can do that. Uh, establishing them you're going to be able to with the Bermuda you can seed that or sod it or sprig it. Uh, with the zoysia most people are going to sod that one. They are seeds available but it's really slow uh, to establish and feel when you do it that way. The benefits of your warm season grasses are there, once you get them established, you can usually, you're done. You're not overseeding They're trying to thicken them back up unless we just have a horrible winter. Uh, so then you can get into things like with your pre-emergence and things to help keep them clean. Um, they also, they grow laterally. They have stolons and rhizomes. So if you do have thin areas, they'll spread and fill. You know, you can fertilize and kind of push and thicken something back up if you get damage from you know, wear whatever. Like we had winter kill this year. We got some dead spots. I know, mm -hmm. we, you know, local golf courses, you've seen it, and some people that have, you know, typically yeah. warm season grass yards, you can see they had some dead spots in it. And, mm -hmm. you know, now is, it's finally just now starting to get filled back in. Yeah, yeah, it took a long time. And, you know, a big area, you may have to go in and seed. You may have to go in and re-sprig and bersaid. Uh, small areas, you know, guys will actually take plugs from a good area and move it. And it'll that's the benefit of the Bermuda. It'll spread, it'll fill. Zoysia's not as aggressive laterally. Usually you'll have to almost replace those areas. Uh, you know, kind of the things to worry about with it, you know, like Bermuda, you have to control it. It'll run into your beds or crawls across the sidewalk and up on the driveway. So there's a lot of edging and things like that that go into taking care of it. Uh, but high traffic areas, you know, it's going to help because it will kind of spread and fill and thicken up. Um, so if you have an area like that, you know, it's a little better choice. Um, we always try to get people to evaluate where they're putting it. You know, it likes a lot of sun. It's not going to do real well in shade. Zoys will do okay in a little bit of shade. So evaluate your property. You know, if you have a really sunny area, uh, you know, especially facing like west, gets a lot of sun all day, you want to go probably warm season. Let's get a little bit further into some of the cool season stuff that I think people are a little bit more familiar with that we've, mm -hmm. you know, you see a lot of use of fescue and things like that. So why don't you let us know what type of cool season grasses we yeah. can grow. Yeah, uh, in this area, you know, most people like fescue. They like that green look, they like the texture of it, uh, the growth habit, all that stuff. Um, you know, our cool season choices are usually going to be turf type tall fescue, which is different than just tall fescue. You know, a lot of people will go by like Kentucky 31 is not a turf type. It's a it's a forage plant. People use it in their lawn. I mean, but it's a lot thicker, gnarlier, leafier plant, a lot harder to maintain in a lawn. Uh, but so, so what we usually recommend are turf types. They're a little finer, made to grow in a lawn, a little easier to maintain that way, uh, a little more uniform when you get them established. 
uh, blue grasses. There's a lot of people using blue grasses here. We don't see a lot of pure blue lawns. Uh, usually people will blend it into to fescue. And you want to do that, I mean, the reasoning for that, it's kind of a survival of the fittest thing. Some of the diseases and issues that fescue get, bluegrass doesn't, and vice versa. So if you have a really tough year with maybe a disease that's knocking out your fescue, you've got some blue hanging on. If you've got something going on the blue doesn't like, you've got some fescue hanging on. So you're going to have several varieties kind of mixed in there to try to have the most success, you know, again, fighting against our environment and our soils. The other cool seasons are rye grasses, which most people aren't going to use as a, as a stand in their lawn. But again, you can overseed like your, your Bermudas with it. A lot of our sports turf guys will do it to have color through the winter, like soccer, football, baseball, right. things like that. Uh, but the rise, you know, perennial rye is the one you'll usually want to use if you're overseeding. It's a lot finer. It's going to be similar to the turf type fescue as far as uh, look. A little darker uh, color too. A little darker color. Doesn't grow as fast. You can actually keep it maintained. Some people will use annual rye. Grows a lot like wheat. Yeah. I mean, it grows a couple inches a day under ideal conditions. Yeah, if I mean, you like cutting grass all through the winter, that's your that's that's what you want to use. That's your that's your choice. Yeah, yeah. and uh, so th those are kind of your cool season choices. You know, the thing with them, uh, they'll do a little better in shade. You know, if you have a shady yard, like you look around here, there's all these big mature trees. Uh, you know, you can go with like a, a cool season turf because it'll have a little bit of protection from the sun and heat. Okay. It'll do better in shade than the warm seasons will. Uh, it's not going to spread. So, you know, you don't have to worry about it running up in your flower beds like you do the warm season stuff, but it's also not going to fill itself if you do get some damage from something. Uh, so it'll usually have to be overseeded in the fall, you know, every year, every few years, just to kind of keep it thick and healthy and, and dense. Okay. So we've got to, what you're saying is we've got to kind of evaluate what our basic stand of grass is in our yard currently. Mm -hmm. We've got to evaluate the light and, and heat that we have available to us. And then at some point we need to, you know, decide: Do we want to go warm season? Do we want to go cool season? Um, do we need to check our soil or anything like that? It's always a good idea. I mean, we try to push people to do a soil test um, to know exactly what you're working with. Uh, you know, it takes the guesswork out. Um, you know, it's, it's a, to me, I try to tell people it's just like going to the doctor and having blood work. You know, they they can tell you what's missing and maybe give you a vitamin or some kind of medicine to take while they're trying to to correct it. You can do the same thing with the soil. You know, you're not guessing and just throwing fertilizer out there. You know what, what needs to be done and when. Uh, with a good soil test, kind of shows the ratios of your nutrients and things like that. You know, there may be some minerals that you need to add to the soil. And, and when you okay. airify, it's a good chance to get those down in there and you're trying to remineralize that soil. In the meantime, you may supplement with some fertilizer that you're putting out to feed that plant because you know it's missing. So that's kind of the way we approach things is that two prong, you know, let's try to fix that soil and get it back where it needs to be. But in the meantime, let's feed the plant because we know it's lacking some of that stuff. Now, what do you use to do a soil test? How do you recommend to do a soil test? You want to take, uh, you want to take, you know, six, seven, eight samples, depending on the size of your yard, and just randomly. You know, if you were doing it here, we'd kind of, you know, front, middle, back, left, middle, right, go down about four to six inches and just put it in a bag together. You know, we have people bring them in all the time just in a Ziploc kind bag. Kind of blend it together too. Yeah, they'll, they'll uh, well, when we send it off, they'll take, and they usually, they only use a very small amount, but they'll dry it to a specific range, and then they'll take what they want out, and they'll test it. Now, do you just come out here and take a shovel and start digging? I mean, what's the what's the best way to do that? Uh, any way you can get it down four to six inches uh, of, of a profile is fine. This is actually a soil probe. This is what most people are gonna use. Uh, you're gonna take it, you know, go, a lot of people put tape or a little mark on here, but go about four to six inches, and then you just uh, you just push it in the ground, and you'll pull that out, and then we'll put that into a bag, and uh, and that's what gets sent off. You know, okay. we'll we'll do five or six of these, mix them together, uh, but you know you can see this is wet. We had all the rain. You see, it's really clay really hard. You can kind of evaluate your soil, you know, by doing this. We have a lot the texture of texture of it. Texture, you know, this one, you can, you can kind of ball it up. The clays will, you know, looks just like modeling clay. That's a huge key. I mean, again, it's taking the, the guesswork out. You know, when you do a soil test, you're you're going right after what, the, what kind of issues you're going to have instead of just guessing. All right, Jason, uh, right now we need to take a little break. So uh, if everybody will just stick around, we'll be right back. Hello, my name is Kane Adams, and I'm the superintendent with the City of Murfreesboro's Urban Environmental Department. With me today is Dr. Frank Hale. He's a plant entomologist with the University of Tennessee's Agriculture Extension. Uh, we're gonna talk about some beneficial 
uh, insects for your home and garden. Uh, Dr. Hale, can you give me some ideas on what types of uh, insects are beneficial? Sure, lady beetles feed on aphids and other uh, soft-bodied insects. Everybody's familiar with ladybugs or lady beetles. We also have green lace wings. They have mandibles that are like uh, pointed and they're very good predators. Big-eyed bugs or some tiny little bugs that will feed on insect eggs. Uh, of course, brain mantises feed on a lot of different insects. And uh, we even have predatory mites that will feed on pest mites. So there's lots of different insects out there that are helping helping you in a beneficial way. Of course, bees and pollinators are considered beneficial also. Now, what can we do to specifically target these beneficial insects and bring them into our, to our yard or our garden area? Sure, we want, what we want to do is make a habitat. Our backyard, we want to make it very attractive to the insects. So we want to have things like forsythia plant blooming here that blooms early, or the saucer magnolia that blooms early to attract in the beneficial insects. They're looking for sources of nectar and pollen. Nectar is a carbohydrate source, pollen is a protein source. So if you have those sources of, of energy and, and protein for the insects, they will be more abundant. And then if you have pest insects, you'll have more of the beneficials to t help take care of that. Well, wow, that's some great tips, Dr. Hill. And you want to have these plants that bloom early, throughout the early spring, early summer, throughout the midsummer, into the fall. So you have something blooming all throughout the growing season to attract and keep the beneficials in your yard. Well, Dr. Hell, we appreciate you coming today and talking with us about all the different insects and what's beneficial and what's not. And uh, if you'll follow Dr. Hale's tips and advice on beneficial insects and promoting those insects, uh, you'll have a much prettier looking yard, landscape, and vegetable garden. Welcome back. We're still got Jason here with uh, Dickens Turf and Landscape Supply, and we're going to get a little further in depth on our talk about soil. Um, something you had mentioned in our previous segment that I kind of think we need to expand on a little bit. You were talking about, you know, you got to decide whether you're going to start over or you're going to work off the existing, you know, turf grasses you got there. What's going to make that decision for the homeowner? You know, that, that's one of the things we talk to people about the most is if you want a really nice yard, at some point you have to establish a turf. You know, you can't just go and spray weeds and magically have a lawn. You have to establish a turf at some point. Uh, so you start out by evaluating it. You know, do you have enough turf there that you can thicken that up or, or work off of that? Or are you mostly weeds and you just need to start with a clean slate and get it established to the point where you can then maintain it? Um, do you want to change grasses? You know, a lot of people will have Bermuda and they don't want it and they try to kill that and go to fescue. So you have to make that decision. And, and this is a great time of year to do it. You know, right now we're in July but we're coming into the point of the year where you want to overseed your, your fescues and establish those in the fall. So you can kind of evaluate and decide, is that something I want to attempt this fall? Do I want to wait till next spring and maybe go with a warm season grass? What do I want to do? Gives you time to get your soil test sent off and get the results back and you can kind of have your plan in place. But basically, like if this were a lawn that, you know, at your house and you wanted to evaluate it, you just walk around in here and see what you got. Uh, you know, do you have predominantly fescue already there? Maybe the people before you or builder, whoever put that in, do you like what's there? You know, are you, are you pleased with how most of it looks? Just want to get the weeds out and get it thicker? Because uh, you can start from that point. You know, you start doing a little bit of post-emergent weed control and then plan on getting a good rate of seed back out there in the fall to thicken that up. Do you have a lot of Bermuda? You know, you walk around out here and especially in the sunny areas, there's a lot of Bermuda growing out here. Mm -hmm. uh, this time of year, it's hard for some people to tell the difference the winter pretty easy the bermuda will be brown and dormant and so if you have a predominantly dormant bermuda lawn and there's only a few weeds maybe you go hey i just want to thicken that up and, and get it clean get the weeds out of it and i'd have a pretty nice turf uh, i'm a big fan of that i mean to me if mother nature's putting that warm season grass there if you want to get rid of it you're fighting you're fighting against what Correct, she's trying to do it's already said hey i like it here i'm doing well and like you're saying you just try to go through and get some of the weeds out of there and, and thicken that grass mm -hmm. up and kind of let it let it take yeah, care of itself. And, and she's provided you with a, with a base and you can work off of that. So to me as a homeowner, you know, it's hard. You get busy, kids, life gets in the way. Uh, trying to establish something that's going to be the easiest to, to maintain is, is what I try to push people towards. So if there's warm season grasses there, hey, maybe let's build off that and, and, uh, and thicken it up. If you don't want it, you just dead set against Bermuda, you know, you need to start spraying to kill it now with products like a Roundup. And you're going to have to spray it probably three or four times. If you want to go to a cool season grass like a fescue or bluegrass, mm -hmm. you want to start 
thinking about it in, in June and July, kind of that time frame? Yes, yes, June, July, especially if you're trying to take out the warm seasons, they're actively growing. Anything actively growing is always easier to kill. Uh, young weeds, if you were talking about weeds, are easier to kill. An established perennial plant like Bermuda with a, an established root system, it's harder to kill. You're gonna have to do multiple applications. And so you wanna time that out, give yourself a couple months before you wanna start seeding. And so I, ideally around here for our cool season grasses, we wanna establish them you know, early, mid-September, up into you know, mid-October normally. I like to air on the early side, get as many roots under it as you can yep. you know, through the fall. But so you make that decision. And the nice thing, you know, if you're trying to get rid of those Bermudas, you know, Roundup is a good choice. Uh, doesn't have any residual in the soil. It's not gonna delay your seeding. Some products, you wanna always, always read the label, but some products are gonna give you, you know, you have to spray this at least 30 to 40 days before you can seed. So you wanna take that into account too, in case you, you know, if you're wanting to seed September 15th, you know that last treatment of some of those products may need to be August 15th. So read those labels and know what you're spraying. Kind of work back from the date you work want to seed. Yeah, and so you, your plan is like this This is when I want to start to establish my lawn. Uh, and then so but once you've decided, you know, warm season, cool season, what you want to do, can you work with what you got? Do I need to just start over? And a lot of times starting over is easier. You just go out there, you get rid of everything, you prep a good seed bed with airification, maybe get a slit seeder. Uh, some people even go in like Harley Rake or do a light tilling, just kind of cultivate that top layer. Prep a seed bed because you always, with when you're seeding a turf, you got to have seed to soil contact. Those seeds have to touch the dirt, basically. Uh, don't need to be planted deep, just kind of pressed into the soil. Don't, but they can't be hung up in a canopy or over on a pot. They have to press, you know, be into the soil. So if you're starting over and you kill everything off and you go out there and you kind of do a light cultivation of some sort, it gives you your best chance to get that seed to soil contact and in fertility and water and grow that grass in and, and get it grown in and thick to the point then you can go into maintenance. You know, <laughs> mowing heights, water and chemical control, all those things. Right. But to get to that point, you have to establish it. And, and that's, you know, we need to start making those decisions, you know, this time of year, if, especially for cool season. Now warm season, you know, we're gonna establish those kind of mid to end of May, early June is usually you know, depending on the spring. When they're in their full have. growing season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Temperature wise, I mean, you know, with cool seasons, you want to be kind of in the, the 70s, you know, 70, 75, cooler nights. With the warm season stuff, you want to be kind of up in those 80s and warmer nighttime temperatures to get those to really feel and be yeah. aggressive. You know, a lot of times, like this year, we had a really slow green up of our warm season. The daytime temperatures were pretty warm, but the nighttime temperatures were staying pretty cool. So it greened up, but it wasn't really aggressively a growing. And the nighttime temperatures are really the key factor yeah. in how quick those warm, yeah. warm season grasses yeah. uh, wake up. Yeah, yeah. Well, we talked a little bit about the timing on that. I know we talked about the timing for warm season grasses. What is, you know, what is the ideal time to aerate and overseed for our cool season grasses? We push people, you know, towards uh, early September. I mean, you can always play the weather. You know, a lot of times September is a really dry month, a little mm -hmm. hot early on. Uh, but I would rather see people air to the early side, go out there and get it airified. Uh, airification gets oxygen in the soil. You know, we were talking about the soil test earlier. You want that pore space, you want oxygen. That's where those roots are gonna go down where you put those airification holes. Gives the seed a place to lay and make that seed to soil contact. A little well to hold water basically so that it can help it germinate and grow. So we try to get people to do that, again, kind of early to mid-September, ideally. To me, I mean, my personal preference, I like to see people go a little early. The more chance you have to get roots underneath that plant, is going to determine how well it does that following summer if we have a right. tough year. Um, so you're yeah. trying to get some root structure established for the for the drought that we know that's coming. It, it, it might not be now, but it's coming at some point. It's coming. And that's, you know, I, I did a talk with some second graders the other day and I brought in a, a slushy and I gave this kid a straw that long. Well, basically that's, that's the same thing a plant does. If a plant only has roots that big, it may have a, a well full of nutrients and water, but it can only get it from right there. Okay. And we want to try to get roots to the point where you can get all of that to that plant. And so that's why we want to go early. The longer it has to grow through the fall, you're getting it established and trying to get it as mature as you can. So basically in the spring, you're trying to, to get it mature and harden it off to go into summer. Uh, a lot of people, you know, will try to seed our cool season grasses in the spring. And you can do it, you know, if you bought a new house or you have an erosion issue, you're trying to fix something. You can seed yeah. in the spring, but you just have to know it's a race to get roots under that plant before it gets hot. What's your opinion on water needs and, and how that should factor into your decision on what type of grass to choose? Yeah, it's uh, I mean, it's a tough question. To me, water is one of the hardest things for people to manage. You know, it, at the golf course, that was probably what we worried about as much as anything was, was water management. Because uh, those cool season grasses, they pull water out of the ground to cool themselves through the summer. And so anytime a plant's growing, it's needing water. 
but like you said, it's supplemental water. Um, and, and you know, talking about establishing a plan in the fall to try to get roots under it, get in the spring, I, grass is a living thing, uh, just like we are. And so, you know, if you were gonna run a marathon, you could start training today for, let's say, June, okay. or you could start in April. You're probably gonna have a better shot if you started early, get your body ready, everything. You're doing that same thing with that plant. So the better root system you can get under it is gonna de kind of determine how much water you need through this, the growing season, how much supplemental water and all those things. I mean, they're, they'll tell you, I mean, if you read books, it'll say about an inch a week through for the growing season. If the plant's actively growing, it's about an inch of water a week for like a cool season turf. It all goes back to me, I, I'm more of a field guy. I go out there and check the soil, take that soil probe and see what your moisture looks like. If it's dry, it needs water. If it's wet, it doesn't. Uh, and and the, in our area, again, we talked about climate. I mean, we could have really low humidity days, windy, but still kind of warm, really sucking the water out of the ground. You're gonna have to do a lot more supplemental water. Uh, high humidity days, there's more moisture in there. The water's not evaporating as fast. You're not gonna use as much. You know, we get some rain. You know, let that do its job. If you pour water into that, you're gonna just, you're gonna saturate that soil profile. You're gonna push the oxygen out. The plant needs oxygen as much as it needs water. So you wanna monitor what's going on there and not just randomly throw water and again, talking about training for a marathon, when you establish that grass, you want to you want to kind of train it for water also. When you establish a plant, you need to start with, with frequent light watering. That seed just needs to stay moist. That's the first step in germination is that seed will soak up water like a sponge until it cracks open and that's when that first little, little shoot comes out. And so it doesn't need to be wet, you know, 10 inches down. It needs to be wet at that soil surface. Just a lot of light. You can water several times a day, just really short burst keeping it moist. Don't have to be muddy, it just needs to be moist all the time until that seed germinates. Mm -hmm. Well, as it germinates, it's gonna put out a little small root. Again, go back, think about that straw. I mean, it can only get water and nutrients from that little small area. So you wanna have fertilizer there so that small root can pull some nutrients, but you wanna have water there. But as you go, your whole goal should be, I'm gonna start trying to water a little bit heavier and maybe space it a little and let those roots go looking for the water and then give it a good drink. Let those roots go looking for water. And so on the front end, you may water several times a day, every day for several weeks. But then as it starts growing, you may go to, well, just once a day. Yeah. And you may go to every other day, but maybe a little more water during the watering periods. More and every third day. deep waterings and, as and it you, gets more yeah. And you almost want to wean it off of the water, especially during a point of the year where like when it's cool and it's going to thrive and it can handle stress and maybe even getting dry to the point it wants of water because it's going to go look and those roots will push and try to find it. Just like if you, were, if you got up and ran every day, you could run. If you sit on the couch just watching TV and you have to go run that marathon, you're struggling. Right. So that's what you want to push that plant to, to make it go get that water so that when we get into the time where it's not conducive to it growing well, when it's 90 plus, it's got that strong root system under there to pull water from as far as it can get it. And you're not gonna have to water as much. You're not gonna have to be sitting there hammering it with water every day. So, you know, if you can get that plant, you know, use the fall to try to harden that plant off, get the roots deep, get them hardened off, get it mature. And then in the spring, you're gonna continue that process until you get to the point where you have to supplementally water, you know, where it's struggling and needing your help. I'm a big fan. I mean, it's just my, you know, from growing grass and doing the things I've done over the years, I try to make the plant do what it can do on its own and then I'll help it if it needs it. Don't try to give it stuff just because it, it can take it, you know. Okay. Be careful with your watering, fertility, it's huge, you know, how you fertilize it and, and maintain it. So, but yeah, just try to train, you know, when you establish, you wanna, you wanna provide the water to get it germinated and up and growing, but then you wanna try to wean it off before it gets into a stressful time. I know that the Bermuda and the Zoysia is a lot, a lot tougher and a lot more, you know, they can handle the heat and a little mm -hmm. bit less water. What kind of watering schedule would you look for on that Bermuda and Zoysia? Uh, you know, you, you could probably still do that inch a week kind of thing, okay. but it could get by with a lot less. And the thing with the warm seasons, when it's hot uh, and it gets dry, it'll kind of hang out, maybe go kind of dormant until it gets rain. It's more prompt, more, more likely to recover. Well, from what we've talked about, it definitely sounds like that the uh, cool season grasses with our current climate around here require quite a bit more work than what you would normally have to put in for a warm season grass. You know, I also know that there's some maintenance treatments that, uh, that, that can be done, whether it be you know, fertilizing, adding a pre-emergent, aerating, mm -hmm. overseeding. Uh, what's some of the timing on that and some of the products that you would use? Yeah, you want to, uh, you, you want to time your applications. You know, me and you were talking earlier, timing is kind of the key to doing this stuff. You know, uh, basically with like your weed control stuff, you're gonna have pre-emergence and post-emergence. You're gonna have stuff that you put down to try to prevent weeds, stuff you put down after the weeds are there to try to get rid of them. Uh, with your cool season turfs, you're usually gonna overseed in the fall. 
All right, so that, that, that eliminates a pre-emergent if you're putting down seed. That, that pre-emergent, it's basically a chemical that makes a layer on the soil and it prevents cell elongation. That, that root, when it comes out of that seed, it can't grow, the plant dies. So it makes that top layer of soil a little sterile for new. Yeah, it just, it just stops that new stuff. So a plant with an existing root system is okay. So if you have a warm season turf, like a Bermuda or zoysia, when all your neighbors with fescues are overseeding, uh, you know, first part of September, you can go through and do a pre-emergent to try to stop all your winter weeds, try to keep them out. Because to me, it's always easier to prevent it than it is to clean it up. Right. So with those, you, you have that option. If you have a good, thick, healthy fescue stand, and you think, man, it's in good shape, you can do a fall pre-emergent it to keep those winter weeds, like your henbit chickweed, all those little purple and white flowers you see in the spring, they germinate in the fall, but they lay there, it gets cold, and they kind of quit growing, and then in the spring, they'll flush out. So to stop those, it's a fall application of pre-emergent, but if you're seeding, you can't do that. So again, that's one more reason to try to get that fescue established, thick, healthy, and it'll tolerate a post-emergent application better if it's hardy and has been mown four or five, six times before you start spraying. Uh, but so anyway, you do your, your fall treatments, you can do a pre-emerge to try to stop those winter weeds or establish that cool season grass. Work on feeding it, fertilize it. You know, people just don't feed it enough to me, in my opinion. You know, put down a good starter fertilizer, something with some phosphorus, and you put down the seed and then come back. And if it's actively growing, if you're mowing grass, feed it. It's, it's, it's living life. It needs something to eat. Then, you know, normally with your cool season turfs in the spring, you're gonna have those little purple and white flowers because you weren't able to pre-emerge. They're pretty easy to kill with like your 2,4-D type, you know, broadleaf herbicides. Those will be a post-emergent application you'll do, you know, probably March, just depending on the weather. You know, it needs to be warm enough. Whenever you're trying to kill weeds, you want them actively growing okay. and preferably young. A young, actively growing weed is the, the easiest one to kill. You don't have a big root system to try to get yeah, rid exactly. of? Exactly, yep. So, uh, so you want to try to time that out. You'll know, I mean, if you're, if you're seeding in the fall, you're going to have to deal with some broadleaf weeds in the spring. Okay. Uh, you can do those weed and feed type products. You know, basically they have that same chemical put on a fertilizer. Or in a granular form. In granular form. The plant needs to be wet. It'll stick to the leaf. The plant will absorb the chemical and die. They're not, they're not as effective as like a spray. It's just harder to get the same amount of chemical in the plant. Okay. But a lot of people, it's easier to put out, especially for a homeowner. They'll work. You know, you may have to do multiple applications, but they'll work. You know, if you're not going to do any other applications, a spring pre-emergent. Um, you're going to do that late February to kind of March sometime. The reason I say that is most of the weeds that that application, it's designed to prevent weeds. And what is preventing are grassy summer weeds, like crabgrass, mm -hmm. those type of things. It's much harder to get a grass out of a grass than it is to get like a broadleaf yeah. out of a grass. Those grassy weeds are, you know, they're tough to get rid they're, of. They're hard, and you know, and it's uh, the things that, that get those are also, they may not kill your turf, but they're gonna ding it. They're gonna yeah. set it back. You're gonna be stunned. You may have to try to grow out of that, recover. You do it, and then we get a hot spell or something, then you've got. See a little yellowing on your on, on the desired turf. Exactly, and you know, and we already talked, we've already got those two strikes against us. We don't know, you know, we're in that transition zone, and we got soils we're having to kind of work against. So now you've dinged it up with some, some herbicide. You, you've thrown another, hurdle to get over Compounded in there. The, yeah. Now you got four strikes. Exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, if you can do those pre-emergence and, and yeah, I do it out of laziness, you know, weeds will grow, put those seed heads up and you're going to have to do a lot more mowing through those summer months because those are summer, summer grasses that are really thriving. Well, your fescue may be hanging on and not, not needing to be cut or maintained, but you've got a yard full of weeds. So you're out there mowing and working. Jason, we sure do appreciate you coming on on gardening in the city today and giving us a little bit of your professional insights. And uh, the one thing I gathered from today is you gotta have a plan. Yeah, it starts with a plan. And, and that's what we see when we help people so much is they wait till there's a problem and then they wanna come in and try to start from there and go forward. Well, let's, let's get a plan. Let's have that turf established and know what we're gonna expect. You know, we know when weeds are coming, when hot weather's coming, when it's gonna need more water. So we're ready to go. We can follow that plan and we're not caught off guard. You know, we can go into maintenance instead of putting out fires. All right. Well, we sure do appreciate your time, Jason. And I'd like to thank everybody at home for watching this episode of Gardening in the City. And please stay tuned for our next episode.